Hey everybody, welcome to Exploring Reality. Uh, today uh, is the second stream of the day, and we'll be talking with Dr. Dustin Crummett, who I'm very honored to have on the show today. And we're going to be talking about his new argument from Psychophysical Harmony. So, uh, Dr. Crummett, how's it going? Thanks for coming onto the channel. All right, yeah, thanks for having me. Hey, so um, I haven't had you on before. I've referenced to you in kind of like a little short video introducing the argument from Psychophysical Harmony before. Um, but for those that haven't seen it or they don't know who you are, why don't you kind of just introduce yourself? Um, we'll go from there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a philosophy professor right now. Um, I got a PhD from Notre Dame uh, in 2018. Uh, I was uh, a postdoctoral researcher in Germany at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich for a few years. Uh, now I live out in the Pacific Northwest. I'm teaching at the University of Washington Tacoma and uh, Seattle Pacific. Um, I recently accepted a new job. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually going to be uh, the executive director of a new nonprofit. Um, oh. uh, I'll be, well, I'll be talking more about that in the future. Okay. But, yeah. We can keep, yeah, I, we can keep it at that for now. Then, <laughs> cool. So, you have this new argument from psychophysical harmony. Um, okay, so I, I this is a question that actually somebody put in already, mm -hmm. and I can understand why they're asking this. Why isn't it this just called the fine tuning of the mind argument? Mm -hmm. So you're the one that made the argument, but my yeah. initial like prima facie <laughs> yeah. response is psychophysical harmony just sounds a lot cooler. <laughs> it does sound a lot cooler. Yeah. So the, 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 the argument, the paper is co-authored by me and Brian Cutter, who's a, a professor in Notre Dame. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the term psychophysical harmony, I, I believe, is not original to us. Um, so the, the phenomenon is actually something that a number of philosophers of mind have written about uh, and have been puzzled by. So we're actually not the only ones who have been, oh, here's my cat, by the way, uh, Apollo. <laughs> Um, oh, I love the name. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he has a, a sister Artemis as well, but she's off in the other room. Um, but uh, a, a number of philosophers of mind have, have written about this and have been puzzled by it. And actually, we quote a number of, of atheist philosophers, in the mind, uh, philosophers of mind in the paper who say, look, psychophysical harmony, this is really puzzling. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm not quite sure how to solve it. Of course, you could solve it if you believed in a benevolent God. That would immediately <laughs> solve the problem. But of course, that can't be true. Yeah. Um, you know, so like, like, let's talk about real solutions. And um, so we're even, yeah, we're, we're not the only ones to talk about this phenomenon. We're also not the only ones to, to realize that it's a, a very puzzling phenomenon unless you believe in God. It's just that... Um, the other, we're the only ones to take that thought seriously. Um, yeah. But anyway, to answer the question, uh, we're not the ones who gave it that name. Um, we could have rebranded it, I guess, when we wrote our paper. But fair enough. So I guess the the, the question is for the audience that hasn't seen your paper or anything: um, What is psychophysical harmony? Mm -hmm. So psychophysical harmony. Oh, I should say Philip Goff refers to it as cognitive fine tuning. So he actually does yeah. follow the listener's suggestion in a way. But um, yeah, so psychophysical harmony, and there's a very long paper that Brian Cutter and I co-authored, which is available online. So the, the very technical, thorough statement of the argument, people can get there. Yep. Um, but psychophysical harmony basically is just the thought that our conscious states, like your subjective experiences, you know, states that it's, it, it's something, there's something that's like to, to be in them, right? It feels, mm -hmm. feels like something. Um, those are matched up with our behavior and our, um, you know, cognition understood in a physical way and these sorts of things um, in ways that are appropriate. So, for instance, uh, you feel pain and pain is bad. And sure enough, we and Apollo and, you know, all the other animals that have physical states, uh, we're disposed to try to avoid the pain, mm -hmm. right, to try to avoid things that exacerbate it. Pleasure is a valuable state. We're disposed to try to follow it. Um, I have, um, you know, uh, a mental image up right now of uh, a black rectangular shiny object. And I'm disposed to report that I have a mental image of a black rectangular shiny object. Mm -hmm. um, 
I maybe there's something that it's like to have beliefs and desires. Some people think that. Um, and if that's right, my actions make sense in light of my beliefs and desires. So I I believed that I could make an effective illustration by picking my phone up and I desired to make an effective illustration. And sure enough, I did pick my phone up, right? And said mm -hmm. the right words. Um, and so that's all psychophysical harmony is, uh, is just this fact that our conscious states are matched up with our behavior and with other aspects of our, our physical bodies in ways that make sense, ways that are rationally appropriate, yeah. semantically appropriate. Uh, you know, I, I accurately report them, those sorts of things. Um, and right now that shouldn't be puzzling, right? I'll say in a minute why that's puzzling. Yeah. Right? That's just what, <laughs> that's just what the phenomenon is. Okay. That was going to be the next question I was going to ask yeah. is that. So go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I, again, I'll say my experience talking about this online is some people immediately think, ah, you know, this is solved by evolution or whatever. And then they just yeah. stop listening. Um, and I want to, again, stress we're not the ones who, who initially said that this was puzzling. <laughs> Atheist philosophers of mine with yeah. no religious agenda said that this was puzzling. So if you immediately think that, th no, that's not it. That's not mm -hmm. it. But, okay. Um, exactly why it's puzzling will depend on what philosophy of mind we subscribe to. What Brian and I suggest is that all of the leading contenders, except for one, which is a minority view, which we think has powerful arguments against it independently, all the other contenders, this winds up being a puzzling phenomenon in the argument works. It will be easiest if we assume dualism and epiphenomenalism. Mm -hmm. And I'll explain why it's puzzling on that. And then we can maybe talk about other views and I'll explain why those other views don't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So um, a number of philosophers of mind, uh, David Chalmers, some other people have accepted both dualism and epiphenomenalism. So dualism is the view that um, mental, like your conscious states are something over and above the physical, right? Yep. They're not reducible to your physical states in any way. Um, and uh, epiphenomenalism is the view that your conscious states actually don't have a causal impact in the physical world. So on dualist epiphenomenalism or epiphenomenalist dualism, um, it, your, your conscious states are these non-physical properties you have over and above your physical, uh, your physical states or their non-physical states you have over and above your physical states, but they don't make any causal difference, right? What happens in the physical world is just determined by the laws of nature. Uh, there's no room, so to speak, for these non-physical properties to make a difference. Um, so does that make sense? So the idea is yeah. you have these non-physical conscious states, but they're they're causally a feat. They don't they don't affect. What yeah. Happens. Yeah. Okay. No, that's what no, that's what it makes sense. Uh, and I, I remember reading through the paper, and you you mentioned that it kind of initially relies on one of these two. Yeah. yeah. But I think in it was in section three or four um, that you kind of even talk about how under the views like idealism or. Um, mm -hmm. Resilient monism. I think there are some more, but yeah, you you showed that like you can still make this work on this. Yeah. So yeah, um, I don't know if you want to talk about that later. Oh, or yeah. I'm getting so way we'll, too far yeah, ahead. Let me, or let me, let me let me talk about why it's a problem on yeah. epiphenomenalist dualism, and then I'll talk about why it's a problem cool. on these other views. Epiphenomenalist dualism. It's kind of a weird view because it, it you know dualism is sort of intuitive to people, but epiphenomenalism is not. This like yeah. You know, my pain doesn't cause me to avoid things, you know, but yeah. some philosophers of mine have endorsed this because they think there are powerful arguments that consciousness is non-physical, but they think it's too spooky to have non-physical things affecting physical things. Right? Yeah. That, that, that's basically what I love the word spooky uh, when it comes yeah, to yeah, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, okay. So on epiphenomenalist dualism, um, dualists are going to think, Look, your conscious states, those are different from physical states. So they could have been hooked up to physical states differently. Mm -hmm. They'll think there could have been, say, beings that were physically just like us, but they didn't have any conscious states. Uh, those are called philosophical zombies. Or there could have been inverts. There could have been a being where, you know, in me, C fibers firing causes pain. Mm -hmm. But there could have been a being where C fibers firing caused pleasure instead or where it caused something totally random. Maybe every brain state just causes random static or something like that, right? A, a random static phenomenal appearance. Yeah. Um, so dualists will say the the fact that 
uh, conscious states happen when they do, that's contingent. It could have been different. That's basically affected by a, a set of natural laws that mm -hmm. govern when those states occurred. Okay. So, and an epiphenomenalist says, if those things had been switched around, it wouldn't make any causal difference to how you behave, right? Because they say your conscious states don't make any difference to the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, so an epiphenomenalist dualist has to say, look, it's totally possible that our conscious states could have been hooked up to our physical states differently. Um, it could have been that we experience pleasure when we experience pain now and vice versa. It could have been that we only experienced, uh, you know, random static uh, mm -hmm. phenomenology. And they would say that wouldn't make any causal effect on the world. So we and all of our ancestors uh, would have behaved exactly the same um, because our behavior, our brain states, all those things are just determined by physical processes. So on that view, it would be the case that um, you know, I experience pleasure when C fibers fire, but I would still behave the same way. I would still, you yeah. know, be aversive and behaviorally, um, and, and so on. It would be the case that I would still say right now, I have a, a rectangular black shiny object in my visual field, even though actually my visual field is just complete static. Mm -hmm. Um, so on this view, it looks in a way, literally miraculous that actually my conscious states, even though they're sort of running in parallel, they're not having any impact on my physical states, that they're hooked up to the physical states in ways that make sense. Uh, it seems, you know, it could have been that I, my pain and pleasure was, were switched around and I would have behaved the same way, yet they are um, set up in a way that makes sense. It could have been that, you know, the felt experience of a belief or a desire, you know, I was totally different and yet I would behave the same way. Uh, mm -hmm. It could have been that I had a different visual image and yet I would make the same visual reports. So um, the thought is, uh, and again, many philosophers of mind agree with this. The thought is on dualism and epiphenomenalism, it becomes incredibly surprising that uh, psychophysical harmony obtains. Um, and then uh, we suggest, but look, psychophysical harmony is valuable. Um, you know, you, you, it, it would be kind of a sorry world if you went around, yeah. you know, inflicting pain on your loved ones, you know, thinking it was a great thing to do, or yep. if you're, you know, you were constantly just, you know, mis like saying false things about what was going on in your own mind, all yep. this sort of stuff, right? Uh, your agency, all, all sorts of, it would be quite bad. So psychophysical harmony is valuable. So it's not wild to think that God would want us to be psychophysically. Yeah. Um, but it does seem quite miraculous if you think of all the conceivable ways that f conscious states could be mapped to physical states. Mm -hmm. Only a tiny sliver of those are going to be harmonious. And really, the, the simplest and most natural ones don't seem harmonious in a lot of cases. The simplest one would be everything is mapped to random static or something. Um, and so it looks like the probability of psychophysical harmony on theism is much higher than it is on uh, atheistic epiphenomenalist dualism. And so there's a good Bayesian argument because the phenomenon yep. is much likelier on theism than on its negation. Uh, there's a good Bayesian argument for theism. Yeah. Um, and uh, if that all made sense, then someone might think, okay, but I'm not an epiphenomenalist dualist. Why should I care about that? Mm -hmm. And then what we say is actually the other leading views in philosophy of mind generate the, the same problem just in a different way and you still wind up having to appeal to theism in order to predict the data so i don't know maybe we should talk about that yeah before, I said before it made sense well yeah so so um the one thing i want to i want to highlight is i it, it's very like swinburnian right um yeah. so uh, that's the basic methodology that i like try to teach at the pop level um and so how like theism is just axiarchic theory things that are modestly valuable are going to be modestly expected on theism. Um, so that's, that all made sense. One of the things that I, even I'm like still trying to work through and I don't know why I'm having a hard time with it. Mm. Uh, it's just one of those things that's just kind of, <laughs> it's hard to conceptualize. It's like on, on the condition of like idealism, like a theistic idealism, mm. how we can make sense of it, even on theistic idealism. I'm, I'm having trouble like connecting it. So I don't know if you can help out there. 
Yeah. Okay. So idealism, I guess, is the view that the mental is primary. The physical either doesn't exist or somehow it is reducible to the mental. So, you know, saying that there's a, a, uh, uh, a phone here is just saying that we're, we are disposed to have certain uh, experiences under certain mm-hmm. conditions. That's what makes it true. That's all there is to the phone being here is just our having certain mental states when mm-hmm. we interact in certain ways. Um, so idealism makes the problem a little different because, uh, in a way, yeah, you can, I mean, if, if all there is to the phone existing is, um, us having certain mental states, then it could, then you might think, oh, well, that solves the problem, doesn't it? Yeah. Because, uh, of course our mental states are going to match up with the world outside of us. Um, that might be true, but then there's kind of a, a more fundamental problem. And this goes back to Bishop. Uh, Barclay, who was the the OG idealist, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Of, well, wait a minute, on idealism, why are our mental states, like, why do they fit together coherently at all, right? Our our mental states um, are as if they were being caused by objectively existing physical objects, right? So, you know, uh, if if you're in the room, you'll see the same phone that I see, um, assuming that we're both yeah, when our visual systems are working correctly and whatever. Um, if we're both in the room, you'll see the same phone that I see. And if I leave the room and come back, the phone will still be here unless someone else took it out. And, yeah, you know, my my mental states over time, they they you know, it's as if I'm perceiving this external world. Uh, they're not just like a random chaos where things are happening. You know, it's not just random static, whatever. Yeah. Um, and so, why is it on idealism that that's true? And Bishop Barclay thinks, well, there's that's because of God. God has arranged things such that our our mental states match up with, you know, my own mental states match up with other mental states of mine to create this coherent picture of the world. And they match up with yours so that mm-hmm. it's as if there's the shared environment in which we're interacting. Um, and so uh, that's that's kind of the the analogous argument that's going to work on, on idealism, we say. Yeah. Um, how is it that Okay, if there isn't some physically independently existing physical world that we're perceiving, but rather uh, the existence of the physical world is just made true by some of our mental states, why is it that we see the same things? And why is it that, uh, you know, the world appears to be stable and blah, blah, blah? Why are our mental states like that? Uh, And Bishop Barclay's answer is because God set it up that way. And we think, yeah, that would be, if you're an idealist, we're not idealists, but if you are an idealist, that's the right way to go. Yeah, fair enough. Um, it, it might be, maybe it would be useful to talk about um, at least interactionist dualism or maybe about physicalism. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, interactionist dualism. So I said epiphenomenalist dualism is conscious states are non-physical and they don't make a, a causal difference to the world. Right. Um, Interactionist dualism says conscious states are non-physical, but they do make a causal difference to the world. And that's much more commonsensical. Right. Okay. So Mm -hmm. I feel pain and that causes my aversive behavior. Right. Um, And you might think, oh, well, that solves the problem then, doesn't it? You know, if you switched around my mental states, I would behave differently. And okay, pain causes aversion behavior and that, you know, it's pretty, a natural selection would select to make sure that blah, blah, blah. And that's all true. Um, given that we hold fixed the causal effects that mental states have. Um, so uh, here's the thought. So this view says you have non-physical conscious states. Those make a causal difference that cause something to happen in your brain, I guess, that cause certain neurons to fire. Um, but we say that each mental state has the effects it does, that is um, itself a contingent matter. So like in the actual world, maybe pain, yeah, causes the neurons that cause aversion behavior to fire. Um, It's conceivable to imagine a world where pain causes uh, the neurons that cause uh, pursuit behavior to fire instead. 
Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit like this. Um, this is this is an analogy that Cameron Bertuzzi gave, which is actually better than the analogy we gave in the paper because it's a little more mm -hmm. easy yet. Imagine I'm driving a car and I notice every time I turn the steering wheel this way, the wheels turn this way. And every time I turn the steering wheel this way, the wheels turn this way, right? Mm -hmm. As happens in a car. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think, oh, that's interesting. There's this match between the way that I turn the wheel and the way that the car goes. Uh, what explains that? Um, well, okay, the, the steering wheel has a causal impact on the direction of the car. Mm -hmm. um, that's true, but it's not, it's not just that, or if I say the steering wheel has a causal impact on the tires. Yeah. Uh, that's true. That's part of the explanation, but it can't be the whole explanation, right? Because you can imagine situations where the steering wheel has a causal impact on the tires, but it doesn't result in the car going the way that I turn the steering wheel. It could be that I turn the steering wheel and that just makes the tires vibrate and it doesn't change their direction. Or it could be that the steering wheel is inverted. I turn the steering wheel this way and it causes the car to go the other way, right? Or any number of other things. Um, it has to be that the steering wheel has just the right causal impact on the tires uh, if there's going to be this match between the way that I turn the steering wheel and the direction that the car goes. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, in a car, that's explained by a designer who made sure that the wheel was hooked up to the wheels of the car in the right way. Um, in the same way, um, yeah, it's true that, I mean, on interactionist dualism, it's true that our mental states, our, our conscious states, have a causal impact on our brains and they cause behavior. Um, but in order for them to have rationally appropriate impacts, uh, the, the causal laws governing them have to be finely tuned. This is, this is the thought. Um, yeah. It has to be that they have the right effects so that, you know, natural selection will associate uh, C fibers firing with avoidance behavior or whatever, right? Um, and so we say, yeah, it, that may well be true. Interactionist dualism may be well be true, but merely positing a causal relationship is not enough to guarantee harmony. It has to be the right kind of causal relationship. Mental states have to have the right effects and that is where it gets puzzling why they have the right effects in the absence of, of theism. So did that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. Um, there's a lot of like interesting questions you get, like whenever I've talked to people, there's a lot of interesting questions you get from this too. So I'm like, there's a lot of objections that I've heard to this, but I don't know if you want to get that far just yet. Um, do, do you think there's anything more valuable that we can talk about? Uh, well, I mean, there are other, you know, we think the argument works on on what we say is the best version of physicalism. We think it works on the best version of panpsychism. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it might be that getting getting deep into the weeds about these theories of philosophy of mind will lose people. Maybe we yeah. should move on and, and yeah. people will read the paper if they want to get the more technical. Yeah, I'm actually going to link the paper into the description of the, the video. Um it's interesting too, just because even on physicalism, I, th I think it's valuable that you bring that up because a lot of people sometimes will just think that Christianity or even theism isn't compatible with physicalism. So I actually have an upcoming video to just showing the compatibility on it. So mm. um, just because I think it's important to show the explanatory flexibility of our theory. Um, so what are like some of the common objections you hear to this then? Um. I think so what what the atheist philosophers of mind who scoff at the idea of a theistic explanation, what they're thinking is, yeah, look, this would solve the problem, but theism is just uh, too implausible otherwise, right? You know, the problem of evil, blah, blah, blah. Um, we know independently that theism is false. So yeah, this is evidence for theism. It's just outweighed by, by other things. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, that's kind of beyond the scope of the argument, I guess. Um, it's just, well, okay, we agree that it's evidence for theism. Um, one thing we say in the paper is, um, you know, we say that this is evidence for theism. There might be other non-naturalistic views, which it, which can also explain psychophysical harmony. So I don't know if you know Emerson Green, but yeah. he, he thinks, oh, well, this just confirms, you know, that one of those views is true. So, yeah. You know, you could believe in, and I think this is what Philip Goff thinks too, actually. He, he, he believes in a kind of pan-agentialism. Yeah. Uh, he thinks solves it. Um, and then 
be sympathetic to maybe some sort of limited design or, mm -hmm. or, you know, Thomas Nagel posits, maybe there are just inherently teleological natural laws that govern the development of the world into more valuable states, or, you know, there are views like that, which <clears throat> are not traditional theism, but which might also be able to explain psychophysical harmony. So you might, you, we, then we have to say, well, you have to decide between theism and those views on other grounds. So mm -hmm. it's true that the argument doesn't get you theism as opposed to necessarily some other kind of weird view, you know? Yeah. Um, of course, it, it may also be that if one of those views is true, maybe that itself would be evidence for theism, right? If there are right. teleological natural laws that govern the development of the world in more and more valuable states, you might think, oh, well, that's likelier if theism yeah. is true. So those aren't necessarily contradictory explanations, but um, uh, a lot of people think that evolution is going to solve the problem somehow. Philosophers we I talk to yeah. do not, do not I, say I find that amongst like the yeah. lay audience a lot. Yeah. People uh, people on the internet think this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, um, and uh, you can tell me if, if this makes if this makes sense. This is why that's not going to help. Um, like the basic correlations. So like the fact that C fibers firing is associated with pain rather than being associated with pleasure. Um, and if you're an interactionist, you know, like the laws governing what causal effect pain has and so forth. Those things on any view are not affected by natural selection. They're either governed by natural laws that say, you know, when C fibers fire, this is the mental state that happens, or their metaphysical identities. It turns out that C fibers firing just is what pain is, or whatever, right? Those aren't things that could be changed by the process of natural selection. Mm -hmm. So those are, are given uh, when evolution is occurring. And it's true that given the actual correlations and the actual causal effects, it's true that natural selection will favor harmony, right? Given that pain is associated with, you know, this neural state that indicates damage and that it promotes avoidance behavior. And what, yeah, it's, it's true that um, natural selection is going to design us uh, so that, or well, given that pain uh, yeah. is associated with this state that promotes avoidance behavior, it's true that natural selection is going to design us so that C fibers firing uh, indicates bodily damage or whatever, right? Um, but uh that's only because we have the right set of initial correlations and causal effects um so you know in the world where you flip around say we're interactionist dualists and we imagine uh inverting pain and pleasure so pain occurs where pleasure occurs now and we invert their causal effects so pain has the causal effects pleasure has now and vice mm -hmm. versa then natural selection is going to promote disharmony because what natural selection cares about is when, under what circumstances does this occur and what are its causal effects? It doesn't care directly about is this harmonious or not. Yeah. Um, so our thought basically is, in a way it's true. I mean, I believe that natural selection actually does explain harmony at some level. Yeah. It's just that the reason that natural selection happens to favor harmonious states as opposed to favoring disharmony or having it be totally orthogonal that is because you have the right set of psychophysical correlations. Um, and that is not something that's explained by natural selection. Yeah. So did that, did that make sense? Yeah. So, so my, like my, my um, elevator pitch version of why this doesn't work is I just tell mm -hmm. people it, it just kicks the explanatory can yeah. back. Yeah. Right. Like we have to ask that we're just kind of moving into a fine tuning argument at that point. Almost. Yeah. 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 Like. Yeah. It's yeah. It would be a little bit like thinking that evolution could explain the fine tuning of the universe, you know, right, evolution exactly. doesn't affect the constant to the natural They're law. Yeah. The, yeah, the it, it can, given, the right, given the right conditions, it can cause there to be complex life like us, you know, it, it well, it together with abiogenesis can cause yeah. a complex life like us. But, um, you know, it, it doesn't explain why the universe is finely tuned. Um, yeah. And it's a little bit similar in that, yeah, uh, it, you know, it, in a world where suppose, uh, you know, the epiphenomenalist dualist world where our only conscious states are just random static mental images, but everything 
behaves the same way. Um, natural selection is, is blind to that, right? It doesn't care. So it's not going to be selecting for harmony or disharmony or anything. It's going to be doing exactly what it does right now, even though now we've switched around all our mental states. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess another, another objection I hear sometimes is what about disharmonious states? You know, people with schizophrenia, that sort of stuff. I was stuff. just going to say, um, um, somebody in the chat actually asked about that if they asked i was just saving mm -hmm. stuff down what about yeah. examples of disharmony like mental illnesses so. yeah yeah so i think what we have to say is look the the interesting thing is that you know when things are functioning properly there's psychophysical harmony and that is fantastically unlikely to just be the product of random chance if our if our argument works um now there is the the problem that sometimes things are not functioning properly and you get disharmony and that is just part of the problem of evil. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes things don't work right and you know just like well what about you know when somebody gets heart disease and then their heart's not working properly well that's part of the problem of evil. In the same way well what about if somebody has a chemical imbalance or you know whatever the cause of a given mental illness is. Um, that's just part of the problem of evil. So it is true that that's worth thinking about, um, but we'll say that doesn't take away from the incredible surprisingness of the fact that like when things are working properly, you do have harmony. And the fact that you do have harmony in the, the vast majority of cases, um, though you do then, it's true the theist will need to say something to explain yeah. what's going on in these other cases. But of course the theist had, had to say something about those cases anyway, right? It's not yeah. like, if not for our argument, then mental illness wouldn't pose any problem. It, it's so it. fascinating to me how just it, it all kind of gets intertwined, right? Mm -hmm. So typically when I'm, um, for instance, I was invited to a college in New York just to kind of do a, a speaking event on a fine tune, like, like my argument for theism that I've kind of compiled, which is pretty much just me being influenced by a bunch of you guys, right? Um <laughs> And so I, I find I found myself as I'm like putting my argument together, actually kind of putting in my my axiology and my theodicy into my fine tuning argument, for instance. So do you find yourself doing that or like thinking like that as you've been yeah. doing this or we we so we don't do that in the paper. I mean, yeah. you know, I do have views about the problem of evil. And in fact, I may I may co-write a book about it at some point in the indeterminate future. Um, but, uh, there, there's kind of a very nascent plan for that. Um, fair enough, but, uh, yeah, we don't talk about it in the paper. I mean, what we say in the paper is basically like, look, you know, the phenomenon that we have is like, so unlikely, um, to be by chance that, you know, even if there's just some tiny chance that some theodicy works for the other things, theism wins with regard to explaining this data. Um, and then we don't get further into questions about the Odyssey. Um, oh, fair enough. So, but, so you think it's so? Do you think the data is strong enough or confirmatory enough that let's just say let's just say our theodicy is something that is completely um, ad hoc versus mm -hmm. like an entailment of our theism? Right. Do you think even if we even if it's an ad hoc like move that we would make, the the data is confirmatory enough? Yeah, I so I think. I mean, unless Brian and I are mistaken uh, in how we're thinking about the problem in some mm -hmm. way, like if our evaluation of the strength of the evidence is right, then I think, yeah, the evidence is powerful enough that it, it basically rules out kind of, you know, ordinary forms of naturalism where there's no order towards value in the world or anything like that. Gotcha. Um, then the question becomes these other kind of weird views, you know, teleological natural laws, a limited designer. Um, could it be that, oh, evil favors those and can explain this at least close to as well. And so, you know, yeah. you can get the best of both worlds. And I think that's sort of what Emerson thinks. Yeah. Um, and then, then you need to get into, well, are there other reasons to favor theism and that sort of stuff? So gotcha. yeah. You, and at that you, point, yeah. you're kind of beyond the, po the scope of the psychophysical yeah. harmony yeah. argument. Yeah. Cool. Um, so we, yeah, we just got a few different questions here, if you want to take them. Oh, yeah, um, sure. So, um, Nahoa asks, he actually has a few questions on here. So, um, so he says, so we, we answered this, actually, but is there anything you want to say just extra on this about how oh, yeah. physical? Yeah, so I, I didn't talk specifically about, 
I, I said that we thought there was on the best version of physicalism, it still worked, yeah. but I guess I didn't get into the details. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so uh, there are like two, two main types of uh, physicalism, um, a priori physicalism and a posteriori physicalism. A priori physicalism says that not only is the physical, you know, physical states and mental states really are the same thing, but that's like a conceptual truth. And it's a conceptual truth that they are the ones that they are. So, uh, you know, it's just, you know, the concept of pain just as the concept of being the thing that causes avoidance behavior or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. it, it will have to be more complicated than that, really. But um, and um, a priori physicalism, we say, is just false. And most philosophers of mine, most physicalists agree with us about that. Um, so these scenarios I've been talking about where I say, we can imagine people who are physically like us, but they don't have any conscious experiences or they have different ones. The a priori physicalist has to say, that's literally incoherent. That's like conceptually impossible. Yeah. I don't even know what you're talking about. Uh, and that doesn't seem correct, right? I mean, it, you can understand what I'm talking about. So yeah. a priori physicalism, we say that would solve the problem, but it's just false. Um, uh, the other, the more popular form of physicalism is a posteriori physicalism. So they say mental states and physical states ultimately are the same thing, but that's not a conceptual truth. You couldn't figure that out by just sitting down and thinking about it. That's something we've learned empirically by watching, oh, you know, this part of your brain lights up and then you feel pain. And so you're feeling pain just must be that activity in your brain or whatever. Um, and this is the most complicated part of the paper. So if what I say doesn't make sense, I encourage the questioner to go read the part of the paper about physicalism. But yes, what we say is, um, okay, if what we're concerned about is like the epistemic probability, um, being a physical, being an a posteriori physicalist doesn't help. Um, because you sort of are granting that your theory doesn't predict psychophysical harmony, you're saying, if all I know is that a posteriori physicalism is true, then any of these other crazy scenarios, those are all live options. It will turn out metaphysically that they're impossible, but epistemically they're all possible. Um, and uh, so it would be like, um, suppose you, you give the fine tuning argument, the ordinary cosmological fine tuning argument. Um, and uh, the other person says, oh, wait a minute, you know, okay, that's a very interesting argument, but here's the thing. The constants are necessarily what they are. I'm a spinazist, so I believe there's only one possible world, and it's this one. The constants are necessarily what they are, so they couldn't have been different. So that solves the problem. Uh, that's not a compelling response, we say, because you want to kind of be like, wait a minute, like that... Like just the view that the constants are necessarily something or other, that doesn't predict fine tuning, right? Mm -hmm. um, what predicts fine tuning is the view that the constants are necessarily what they are and they're finely tuned constants. Um, so you have to add this other thing that's super unlikely uh, on just the general theory in order for it actually epistemically to predict the data. Mm -hmm. uh, and we say the same thing here. A posteriori physicalism on its own doesn't predict psychophysical harmony. In fact, it, it's not clear that it even makes it any more likely. Mm -hmm. uh, what it does is if you add in and the the actual, like the correct identities are these harmonious ones, then it predicts it. But of course, that comes at a, a hit to the prior probability because you've built in this, you, you've just chosen this highly yeah. significant version. Um, so basically, that's our response. We say a priori physicalism, that's just false. A posteriori physicalism, I think that that's false too. But for our purposes, it can be true. It's just that doesn't actually predict harmony. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's that's what we say. As I say, I, this is that's the hardest part of the paper. That's the part of the paper that the referees had the most questions about. Whatever. Yeah. So. Um, you know, if what I said is not clear, I would encourage people to go read the paper and see the the more the more specific argument that we give because it gets into some technical stuff about yeah. the metaphysics of modality and Bayesian. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, Noho is a good friend of mine too. So right. if he has questions, I'm 
I, what you said made total sense. The, oh, okay. So uh, here's another question. So, um, and this is this is interesting to me because I have my own thoughts on this, but it also depends on how you cash out what these theories actually mean. <laughs> um, so he says, um, why should we prefer theism over like axiarchic agent of cosmopsychism? Hmm. So I, maybe I should just say, I'm going to have a conversation on Emerson's channel with uh, Philip Goff nice. in, a couple months in January. So tune into that. I'm very um, excited for we'll, that. I'm, I'm sure we'll wind up talking you, about when, that. when you have a link, let me know and I'll start yeah. broadcasting that yeah, too. Sure. Oh, I should have, I should have, um, I should have talked about my own YouTube channel too. I have my own YouTube channel. I have it linked. Dustin from it. Okay. Yeah. People should go subscribe to me. Yes. No, right definitely. Now. Please subscribe. He, he, there's so much <laughs> cool stuff on there. Um, I find your stuff very valuable and no, it's, no. like it, it's, it's, I, I drew, I really do want to highlight, especially when it comes to stuff that like typically Christians do not hold positions on certain things. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important to kind of just highlight how cool that is. Like, um, and so, yeah, please go subscribe. Um, but yeah, so anyway, so you're going to have a d discussion with Philip Goff. Um, yes. um, is there anything else you wanted to say on that? Or is that more, is this going to be more of like a just uh, wait till that kind of thing? I, I think the simplicity thought is part of the answer. Yeah, okay. I don't think it's the, the whole answer, but I think that he and I are going to talk about all this. So Cool. Yeah. So then everybody tune into that when the time comes. Um, I'll share the link on the channel when it's ready. Yeah. Um, so we already talked about this one. Okay, this one's interesting because I, I Emerson brought brought this up, um, mm. and it's the whole like the revenge problem. So it seems like it uh, God would have to have like some sort of psychophysical harmony as well. Um, can you what, what's your move there? Yeah. So I think what I want to say there I. I gave a couple possible solutions when I mentioned Emerson, but the, the main thing I want to say is um, I think that uh, the intrinsic probability of just us being harmonious for no deeper reason, just by chance, super low. Um, I think that God's being harmonious will be entailed by some of God's other attributes. Maybe God's, whatever you take God's fundamental essence to be, if it's that of a perfect being, you know, a perfect being will be psycho psychophysically harmonious or maybe, uh, you know, omnipotence um, entails being psychophysically harmonious or omnipotence in conjunction, you know, whatever. Right. Um, so then the question will just be, is it super intrinsically improbable that there is a being like that, that there is a being who's absolutely perfect or something like that? And then you get into other questions about intrinsic probability. But I don't think that that is um super super intrinsically improbable so basically the answer is going to be god's psychophysical harmony is going to be explained by some more fundamental property that god has uh which it's not super crazy or ad hoc or complex to yeah so so my question there like if somebody's um strict like strong um classical theist with mm -hmm. strong dds doctrine would mm -hmm. that affect that yeah, that so that there there might not even be any psychophysical harmony, or it would take some very different form, right? Yeah, the God has God is his one mental state, which is also all these other things, and yeah, I I guess probably that solves the problem. I think that it solves the problem at the price of an incoherent view. I don't yeah, know. I, I, I would generally, I would, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a person, I'm a personalist. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I, I am too. But yeah, I, I think, um, so maybe it, maybe it solves the problem by cheating. Sort of, but I, I think if we grant that view, yeah, that, that's I'm so sorry to any Thomas watching this. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, ooh, this, this is an interesting question. So uh, Nahal asked if any of these psychophysical laws have official names recognized by oh. neuroscientists. I don't think so. I mean, there's, um, yeah, I guess I'm not the person to ask about this. I mean, we know certain correlations, right? We know all oh, when C fibers fire, that results in pain or whatever. Um, I, this is a classic, I should say, this is, C fibers firing is a classic philosophical example. <laughs> oh, C -fibers firing I, I've pain. recently heard that it's not even C fibers firing. It, well, like one one kind of pain is related to C fibers fire. <laughs> there's another kind of pain that's not. Um, 
I, I was shocked when I took a psychology class and realized that because I already taken some philosophy class, I was shocked when I took a psychology class and realized that C fibers were real because I thought it was just some philosophy of like, whatever causes pain. Yeah. Say that's a C fiber, you know? I, you um, thought it was one of those like prime ministers, prime number things. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. I thought it was just a, you know, that's just a placeholder made up thing, you know, whatever yeah. structure. Yeah. But anyway, um, uh, yeah. I mean, we know certain things about, um, about, uh, you know, which brain states are correlated with which conscious experiences and things. Ideally, I guess what we would have is some general theory, like a certain simple set of principles that explain, you know, why it is that all these different correlations hold. And I don't think that we have that. I think there are people interested in trying to develop that, but I don't think we have that. So I, my guess is that we actually don't know what the laws are yet. Um, we just that's, we know certain implications of them, but fundamentally what they are, I, I doubt that we know, even though mm. we have maybe some theories. But that's pretty cool. Um Apologetics Squared, if you know who he is, um asks, is this argument as strong as the rest of natural <laughs> theology component? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not the person to ask because I have a vested interest in, uh, you know, it's my it's my argument. So I, I uh, I'm inclined to judge it favorably. I, I think it might be the strongest natural theological argument. Yeah. I mean, again, maybe maybe I'm biased, but I'm uh, I'm like so I'm one of those people that's just very care. I'm, I'm probably overly hmm. I don't know, maybe there's no such thing, but I'm a little overly cautious. And so mm. um, I haven't implemented this into like my everyday argumentation yet, just because mm. I'm still, it's new. I'm like, yeah, like, yeah, that's, that's reasonable. Yeah. Maybe what I should say is, again, if Brian and I are thinking about it in the right way, then I think it's an incredibly powerful argument. Yeah. It's not a complete natural theology because you still need some story about why theism rather than some yeah. other view that might be, you know. But um, I think if we're thinking about it the right way, then it's an incredibly powerful argument. Um, yeah. And so, you know, my any hesitation I have about it would be this kind of meta level worry about are we just thinking about it in the wrong way? Um, and that's hard to um that's hard to measure. And, you know, it might be that your instinct is a good one because this is a pretty new argument, you know, how it hasn't been tested as much by critical whatever yet. Um, so uh, I don't I know. Think exactly. it works. What? I, th I think it works. I'm just like, yeah, yeah. Careful. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. I, I think again, either it's very, very powerful or Ryan and I have made some sort of mistake in how to evaluate the evidence. Um, yeah, I, I think it's I, I think it's also helpful. I'm sure you've heard like the electrons and love argument mm -hmm. um, against the fine tuning. And while, yeah. while I think there's ways to kind of circumvent some of the issues that um, that argument kind of brings up, this argument from psychophysical harmony is just kind of like this thing you run in response to that it seems yeah. to. So yeah, I, I think it gets around a couple of a couple of possible worries with the ordinary fine tuning argument. Yeah. Um, one of which is the electrons and love thing. Uh, one of which is multiverse worries. There are some others we talk about in the paper. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think, I mean, my, my view basically is that it has the strengths. I mean, it's at least as strong in, in positive terms as the fine tuning, the ordinary fine tuning argument and it avoids the major worries for it. Yeah. Um, uh, so, one of the things that I was thinking about, and this is kind of just on my own thoughts, is uh, I think it's in chapter six of Swinburne's The Existence of God. Mm -hmm. He kind of talks about why God would want like embodied moral conscious agents. Um, and it seems to me like part of his justification for that general theme. Yeah, I don't know if you remember too much about that book or how <laughs> recently you've read it, but um, part of like why he he argues that it seems like this argument could actually fit into um, his argument for why the, like we are yeah. expected on theism, but I, yeah. I don't, I'm still working through yeah. that. What do you I, think? I, I think so. Yeah. His, his argument for why God would produce embodied moral agents is it like those purposes are not going to be served if they're not psychophysically harmonious. 
Um, so yeah, I, I think it fits in well. Cool. Um, it seems like this is a little unrelated, but I figured I'd just ask because it's an audience member asking a question. Um, what do you think about Draper's argument that our minds are dependent or identical to the brain while God's mind is non-physical? Hmm. Yeah, so uh, it's it's not directly related um, because, like I said, you know, our argument we think works on what we think yeah. is the most philosophers think is the yeah. most powerful version of physicalism. But um, yeah, I guess Draper's argument is something like uh, we have this really good evidence that our minds are dependent on the brain, but God's mind is supposed to not be dependent on the brain. So what? Maybe that's a kind of like inductive argument against theism or yeah. something like that. Um, yeah, I guess I, I don't think that our minds are identical to the brain. I actually, I mean, I'm a substance toolist and I think that there yeah. are good arguments for that. So people can Google and YouTube and find some other videos I've done where, where I talk about what I think some of the arguments for that are. Um, yeah, I guess, um, you know, in general, it's going to depend. Yeah, I mean, what exactly is the structure of that, of that argument? If if God has good reasons to produce embodied agents, then it, as Swinburne argues, as you know, uh, then it's not going to, um, then embodied agents are predicted by, by theism, so it's not evidence against theism, right? Um, and I think, you know, I know Ben Watkins has tried to treat this as an inductive argument where it's something like, look, all the minds we know about are dependent on brains and God. So probably all the minds there are are dependent on brains. But the problem with that, in my view, is that we, we clearly have like a biased sample, right? We live in the mm -hmm. physical world. Of course, you know, we're going to be where the physical minds are like. Um, so I don't know. I mean, maybe the, yeah, my reading of, of that argument from Draper is not terribly fresh. So maybe if, if what I said doesn't address like his real point, maybe the questioner can, can yeah. the issue a little bit. But. Yeah. I think there's a few ways to interpret this. Like one of the other ways I think you could try to cash this out is probably just from a background knowledge argument to say that mm. maybe something like theism is just like epistemically has a lower prior probability than theism yeah. because our minds are physical so we're introducing like a new type of substance yeah. or something like that. that that's another way i could interpret that yeah um yeah i mean of course you know my my view is that actually philosoph like even apart from thinking about theism we have good reasons to think we're non-physical minds that are yeah. continually related to bodies and then it doesn't seem like theism that there could be a, a supreme mind that's not related to a body doesn't seem so weird yeah yeah and if, if you guys wanted to know why go watch my older stream from earlier today with Dr. Rasmussen, even though I think, even though um, Rasmussen and Dr. Comet um, have different views on philosophy of mind. <laughs> I think the one thing you, the, the thing you do agree on is um, that we're not purely physical beings, yeah. which I would also agree with. Um, cool. Um, Squared asks, um, since this renders naturalism and such improbable, what do you think is the most probable after theism? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess, you know, again, I have this debate with Philip Goff, or not yeah. a debate, just a, a discussion with Philip Goff that's coming up. Um, we're not going to debate. We're just going to talk in a friendly way. But um, yeah, so maybe <laughs> maybe that. I'll have to think more about that in, in relation to this. I mean, I guess there's a question about whether limited designer views count as theism or not. I mean, they're not normal theism, but maybe they're theism of, of some sort. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe something like that. Um, maybe, I don't know, Philip tries to, I've, I've read a manuscript of a, a book he has where he tries to lay out various views on which there's purpose in the universe, but not they're not traditional theism. Um, and yeah, those are worth thinking about, I think. Um, I don't know exactly which one I would say is, is the strongest. Um, maybe if we don't count some sort of limited designer view as a form of theism, maybe some sort of limited designer view. But okay. um, yeah, I, I think, um, I don't know. I, I think, well, anyway, I have worries about that sort of view. But. Fair enough. Cool. Well, um, we're coming up on that hour mark and I want to respect your time. Do you have anything else you kind of want to say? Plug. Um, I got your YouTube channel. I'll put your paper in the link of the video. Um, anything else? 
Your website's um, on there too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Nothing else that jumps to mind. Um, awesome. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on yeah, here yeah. Um, and just kind of helping us reason through this and see the value in the argument that you've put up. Um, yeah. I just really appreciate that. So if yeah, you have, no, if you don't no, have no, anything no, else, no. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of sign us off here. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Cool. Well, thanks everybody for watching. Um, God bless. And please go subscribe to Dr. Kerman's YouTube channel, support his work. Have a good day, everybody.